Assalamu alaikum. Hi everyone. Today I am with the Rabbi Elon Goshen God. That's a difficult name. I will ask Rabbi himself to correct it. Um, Rabbi, is that how I say your name or did I mess it up? It's Alon Goshen Gottstein. Gottstein means the stone of God. So it's strong foundations that we're trying to put in place for the world, for divinity. Stone of God. Interesting. Amazing. Um, Rabbi, you work in, you have started an organization called Elijah Interfaith Organization. Well, Who is Elijah? Elijah Interfaith Institute. Elijah is the biblical prophet. And, uh, you know, some people very often ask me, or occasionally people ask me, why Elijah? After all, he was very intolerant of idol worshippers, but he sort of underwent a metamorphosis. In later rabbinic thought, he's someone who unites differences, and he ushers the way for a messianic future. And Elijah, for me, is a figure, we're all working to prepare for a better world. And, and in my own internal world, uh, Elijah is a symbol for that. Also in the Christianity, he's also known in, in Islam as Al-Khidr, and he's not known in other faiths. But, you know, when you call a baby, the parent has a privilege of calling a baby. Cool. Naming a baby. So walk us through your life. How old are you now? Twenty five. So how did these twenty five years pass? You know, start. How did it start? I'm, I'm twenty five now for the thirty sixth time. And uh, really, thirty uh, sixth time or three times? No, thirty sixth time that I'm twenty five. I mean, not twenty five times twenty five. It's twenty five. The next year is twenty five. Next year is twenty five. Like this, I'm sixty. Oh, okay. And uh, I'm a I'm a spiritual seeker. And my whole path is because of a spiritual quest. Uh, my being a peacemaker is a byproduct of my being a spiritual seeker. I'm a seeker of spirituality, a seeker of wisdom. And that has taken me deeply into my Judaism. It's also taken me into formative relationships with people of other faiths. And over the years, I accumulated a fair amount of understanding, both academically and spiritually, through my connections with people of other faiths. And then when my midlife crisis hit at 40, and I hope I live longer than 80 because I have a lot to do and I don't know if 20 years will be enough. But when I hit my midlife crisis at 40, the question arose, so what is it all about? I was teaching at university and I needed to identify <coughs> what is the long-term purpose in my life. And eventually the answer came forth in this creation of this organization. Uh, took a while to have got the name Elijah. Uh, that started off as a consortium of 13 Jewish, Christian, and Muslim schools and then eventually grew into... A uh, very, very significant and representative uh, cutter of world religious leaders and scholars who collaborate on a variety of initiatives, publications, and bringing their voice to the world. And the most recent of these is this Make Friends campaign. Amazing. So, can you walk us through where were you born? Where did you go to school? How, what did your father do? How do you sound like an American? Ah, you're always concerned about you. You're always jealous of my accent. My accent very jealous. Right? I see you're very, very jealous. Maybe maybe the U.S. people would have given you less trouble with your visa to America if you had a good accent like me. Maybe. But my parents were already living in Israel, and I grew up in Israel. But because my father was an academic, we spent time on sabbatical. So from a young age, I spent some blocks of time in the United States, and that obviously impacted my accent. So I spent a couple of years there, you know, around early adolescence. And then I spent another year there starting at Harvard University. I was married to American. So I have, I have an American connection, but I myself, I'm not American in any way, but I do use U.S. dollars and I have an American accent. And the uh, father was a preacher like yourself or? No, I don't know that I would say I'm a preacher. I'm a, I'm a thinker, a scholar, a theologian, a visionary. I wouldn't say I'm a preacher. I suppose I preach a certain gospel of interreligious harmony, but I, I'm not really a preacher. No, he was, a, he was an academician. He taught at university and we had people from different religions uh, come into our home because you know because he worked on the Bible. People from different traditions came to study, uh, to study with him, and that's how that's how we got those relationships. And you, uh, and when you say you're a rabbi, I thought that was a, in in Islam we normally call it a preacher. So is rabbi not a preacher? Rabbi is someone who's proven himself in a certain capacity of learning and therefore has authority to teach. Uh, then next step is what you do with it. For a while, I was a chaplain in the army, so that was that was a capacity to preach. Most rabbis have synagogues. I don't because I took, chose an academic career. But eventually, when last twenty years, I've been more and more of a rabbi just because of my interfaith work, where religious affiliation is important. So 
being rabbi in some ways more helpful than being doctor or professor. Now, um, you have started this campaign called Make Friends Campaign. And your video is amazing. And it's, it is there and it is asking. It is spoken by different religious leaders of different religion, asking people of other religions to make friends with people of other religion. Now, the history uh, in journal tells us something else, or maybe the media or the parents or the culture tells us um, that we are not supposed to be friends with the friends of, or I mean, the followers of other religions. How can this doctrine, how did this doctrine just change? What happened? So, um, this is a complex question. Historically, we do have precedents of friendship, we, but we don't have a history of teaching friendship as an ideal between religions. So, what's happening is that world religious leaders and thinkers are realizing we need to move beyond civility and respect. And we, and we have identified friendship as an important way to go forward. And as we presented it to leaders, we could see they, they, they resonated with it. They really felt that this was an important way to suggest to humanity for its future. Until now, most of the emphasis on friendship has been within, you know, Muslims are friends with Muslims. As long as they're the same denomination, these days there's great struggles going on in Israel between different groups. You're only friends with one group, not with the other group. And this is a call for a kind of universal friendship, a friendship that rises beyond the particularities of the group. What makes it possible is that within all our traditions, we have the resources. We have to choose to apply them. We have the resources for a united humanity, an interconnected being, uh, all of creation being one. The resources are there. You need the combination of will to address these and recognition that the moment is right to give that teaching. And thank God there are enough leading religious leaders in the world that have that perspective and are willing to do that. Now you are a Jew, you're a Jewish, and... Um, as I'm both, I'm both a Jew and Jewish. You're both a Jew and a Jewish. Um, in, normally, Judaism and people of the Jewish faith, which I found, were self-contained, meaning they don't need to reach out you, you grow at a certain size and you don't need to reach out to a certain other denomination. Is there some religious context to it that it is it, in the past it was not promoted or in Judaism are Muslims and Christians seen as enemies somehow? And is it changing? It's all a matter of historical context. And sometimes they were friends, sometimes they were enemy. Jews were persecuted for such a long time that it's deeply in their cult, in their psyche, that everyone is their enemy. It's all a matter of the context and how you apply that context to historically to to whatever other relevant consequences. So, uh, Jews ideally have a teaching of friendship. On the other hand, they have a need to affirm their identity, and they have been persecuted now. You know, certainly under Christianity, but also significantly under Islam. And even today, you look at the hatred towards Jews that's being generated both towards Jews and towards Israel. So it's understandable that they, many of them are, are preserving their identity at the expense of making contact with others. But that's only one paradigm. There's a second paradigm, a paradigm that's characterized by, characterized by notion of tikkun olam, going out and serving, uh, doing well for others, becoming part of a broader society. And the tension is how to do that while maintaining identity. But the, the ultimate goal is to be able to uphold both of these, both the, both the sense of true and profound identity and a sense of friendship. And I think it's a sign of the times that this teaching is coming into place. And it's also a sign of the time in Judaism. I mean, we have on this project the chief rabbi of Israel who represents pretty, pretty much that sector of society that you described earlier as uh, self-contained, and yet... He supports this message of freedom and the th of freedom, sorry, of friendship, and I think it's because he recognizes from where he's sitting that that's what we need for the world to be a better place and for all of us to grow together. 